Chapter Seven of Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. The Slipperfox recording is in the public domain. Seventh Chapter, Our Virtues. Two hundred and fourteen. Our virtues. It is probable that we too have still our virtues, though naturally they are not those sincere and massive virtues on account of which we hold our grandfathers in esteem and also at a little distance from us. We Europeans of the day after to-morrow, we firstlings of the twentieth century, with all our dangerous curiosity, our multifariousness and art of disguising, our mellow and seemingly sweetened cruelty in sense and spirit, we shall presumably, if we should have virtues, have those only which have come to agree best with our most secret and heartfelt inclinations, with our most ardent requirements. Well, then, let us look for them in our labyrinths, where, as we know, so many things lose themselves, so many things get quite lost. And is there anything finer than to search for one's own virtues? Is it not almost to believe in one's own virtues? But this believing in one's own virtues, is it not practically the same as what was formerly called one's good conscience, that long, respectable pigtail of an idea which our grandfathers used to hang behind their heads, and, often enough, also behind their understandings? It seems, therefore, that however little we may imagine ourselves to be old-fashioned and grandfatherly respectable in other respects, in one thing we are nevertheless the worthy grandchildren of our grandfathers, we last Europeans with good consciences, we also still wear their pigtail. Ah! if you only knew how soon, so very soon, it will be different. 215. As in the stellar firmament there are sometimes two suns which determine the path of one planet, and in certain cases suns of different colours shine around a single planet, now with red light, now with green, and then simultaneously illumine and flood it with motley colours. So we modern men, owing to the complicated mechanism of our firmament, are determined by different moralities. Our actions shine alternately in different colours, and are seldom unequivocal, and there are often cases, also, in which our actions are motley coloured. 216. To love one's enemies. I think that has been well learnt. It takes place thousands of times at present on a large and small scale. Indeed, at times, the higher and sublimer thing takes place. We learn to despise when we love, and precisely when we love best. All of it, however, unconsciously, without noise, without ostentation, with the shame and secrecy of goodness, which forbids the utterance of the pompous word and the formula of virtue. Morality as attitude is opposed to our taste nowadays. This is also an advance, as it was an advance in our fathers that religion as an attitude finally became opposed to their taste, including the enmity and Voltairean bitterness against religion, and all that formerly belonged to freethinker pantomime. It is the music in our conscience, the dance in our spirit, to which Puritan litanies, moral sermons and goody-goodness won't chime. 217. Let us be careful in dealing with those who attach great importance to being credited with moral tact and subtlety in moral discernment. They never forgive us if they have once made a mistake before us, or even with regard to us. They inevitably become our instinctive calumniators and detractors, even when they still remain our friends. Blessed are the forgetful for they get the better even of their blunders. 218. The psychologists of France—and where else are there still psychologists nowadays? 
have never yet exhausted their bitter and manifold enjoyment of the bêtise bourgeoise, just as though, in short, they betray something thereby. Flaubert, for instance, the honest citizen of Rouen, neither saw, heard, nor tasted anything else in the end, it was his mode of self-torment and refined cruelty. As this is growing wearisome, I would now recommend for a change something else for your delight, namely the unconscious astuteness with which good, fat, honest mediocrity always behaves towards loftier spirits and the tasks they have to perform, the subtle, barbed, Jesuitical astuteness, which is a thousand times subtler than the taste and understanding of the middle class in its best moments, subtler even than the understanding of its victims, a repeated proof that instinct is the most intelligent of all kinds of intelligence which have hitherto been discovered. In short, you psychologists, study the philosophy of the rule in its struggle with the exception. There you have a spectacle fit for gods and godlike malignity. Or, in plainer words, practice vivisection on good people, on the homo boni voluntatis, on yourselves. 219. The practice of judging and condemning morally is the favourite revenge of the intellectually shallow on those who are less so. It is also a kind of indemnity for them being badly endowed by nature, and finally it is an opportunity for acquiring spirit and becoming subtle. Malice spiritualizes. They are glad in their inmost heart that there is a standard according to which those who are over-endowed with intellectual goods and privileges are equal to them. They contend for the equality of all before God and almost need the belief in God for this purpose. It is among them that the most powerful antagonists of atheism are found. If any one were to say to them, A lofty spirituality is beyond all comparison with the honesty and respectability of a merely moral man, it would make them furious. I should take care not to say so. I would rather flatter them with my theory that Lofty spirituality itself exists only as the ultimate product of moral qualities, that it is a synthesis of all qualities attributed to the merely moral man, after they have been acquired singly through long training and practice, perhaps during a whole series of generations. That lofty spirituality is precisely the spiritualizing of justice and the beneficent severity which knows that it is authorised to maintain gradations of rank in the world, even among things, and not only among men. 220. Now that the praise of the disinterested person is so popular, one must, probably not without some danger, get an idea of what people actually take an interest in, and what are the things generally which fundamentally and profoundly concern ordinary men, including the cultured, even the learned, and perhaps philosophers also, if appearances do not deceive? The fact thereby becomes obvious that the greater part of what interests and charms higher natures, and more refined and fastidious tastes, seems absolutely uninteresting to the average man if, notwithstanding, he perceived devotion to these interests, he calls it desinteresse, and wonders how it is possible to act disinterestedly. There have been philosophers who could give this popular astonishment a seductive and mystical other-world expression, perhaps because they did not know the higher nature by experience. Instead of stating the naked and candidly reasonable truth that, Disinterested action is very interesting, and interested action, provided that. And love? What? Even an action for love's sake shall be unegoistic. But you fools! And the praise of the self-sacrificer? But whoever has really offered sacrifice, 
knows that he wanted and obtained something for it, perhaps something from himself, for something from self, that he relinquished here in order to have more there, perhaps in general to be more, or even feel himself more. But this is a realm of questions and answers, in which a more fastidious spirit does not like to stay. For here truth has to stifle her yawns so much when she is obliged to answer. And after all, truth is a woman, one must not use force with her. 221. It sometimes happens, said a moralistic pedant and trifle retailer, that I honour and respect an unselfish man, not, however, because he is unselfish, but because I think he has a right to be useful to another man at his own expense. In short, the question is always who he is, and who the other is. For instance, in a person created and destined for command, self-denial and modest retirement, instead of being virtues, would be the waste of virtues, so it seems to me. Every system of unegoistic morality which takes itself unconditionally, and appeals to every one, not only sins against good taste, but is also an incentive to sins of omission, an additional seduction under the mask of philanthropy, and precisely a seduction and injury to the higher, rarer and more privileged types of men. Moral systems must be compelled, first of all, to bow before the gradations of rank. Their presumption must be driven home to their conscience until they thoroughly understand at last that it is immoral to say that what is right for one is proper for another. So said my moralistic pedant and bonhomme. Did he perhaps deserve to be laughed at when he thus exhorted systems of morals to practice morality? But one should not be too much in the right if one wishes to have the laughers on one's own side. A grain of wrong pertains even to good taste. 222. Wherever sympathy, fellow suffering, is preached nowadays, and if I gather rightly, no other religion is any longer preached, let the psychologist have his ears open. Through all the vanity, through all the noise which is natural to these preachers, as to all preachers, he will hear a hoarse, groaning, genuine note of self-contempt. It belongs to the overshadowing and uglifying of Europe, which has been on the increase for a century, the first symptoms of which are already specified documentarily in a thoughtful letter of Galliani to Madame d'Epinay, if it is not really the cause thereof. The man of modern ideas, the conceited ape, is excessively dissatisfied with himself, this is perfectly certain. He suffers and his vanity wants him only to suffer with his fellows. 223. The hybrid European, a tolerably ugly plebeian, taken all in all, absolutely requires a costume. He needs history as a storeroom of costumes. To be sure, he notices that none of the costumes fit him properly, he changes and changes. Let us look at the nineteenth century with respect to these hasty preferences and changes in its masquerades of style, and also with respect to its moments of desperation on account of nothing suiting us. It is in vain to get ourselves up as romantic or classical or Christian or Florentine or Barocco or national in moribus et artibus. It does not clothe us. But the spirit, especially the historical spirit, profits even by this desperation. Once and again a new sample of the past, or of the foreign, is tested, put on, taken off, packed up, and above all studied. We are the first studious age, in puncto, of costumes. I mean as concerns morals, articles of belief, artistic tastes and religions. We are prepared, as no other age has ever been, for a carnival in the grand style, for the most spiritual festival laughter and arrogance, 
for the transcendental height of supreme folly and aristophanic ridicule of the world perhaps we are still discovering the domain of our invention just here the domain where even we can still be original probably as parodists of the world's history and as god's merry andrews perhaps though nothing else of the present have a future our laughter itself may have a future 224 the historical sense or the capacity for divining quickly the order of rank of the valuations according to which a people a community or an individual has lived the divining instinct for the relationships of these valuations for the relation of the authority of the valuations to the authority of the operating forces this historical sense which we europeans claim as our speciality has come to us in the train of the enchanting and mad semi-barbarity into which europe has been plunged by the democratic mingling of classes and races it is only the nineteenth century that has recognized this faculty as its sixth sense owing to this mingling the past of every form and mode of life and of cultures which were formerly closely contiguous and superimposed on one another flows forth into us modern souls our instincts now run back in all directions we ourselves are a kind of chaos in the end as we have said the spirit perceives its advantage therein by means of our semi-barbarity in body and in desire we have secret access everywhere such as a noble age never had we have access above all to the labyrinth of imperfect civilizations and to every form of semi-barbarity that has at any time existed on earth and in so far as the most considerable part of human civilization hitherto has just been semi-barbarity the historical sense implies almost the sense and instinct for everything the taste and tongue for everything whereby it immediately proves itself to be an ignoble sense for instance we enjoy homer once more it is perhaps our happiest acquisition that we know how to appreciate homer whom men of distinguished culture as the french of the seventeenth century like saint evremont who reproached him for his esprit vaste and even voltaire the last echo of the century cannot and could not so easily appropriate whom they scarcely permitted themselves to enjoy the very decided yea and nay of their palate their promptly ready disgust their hesitating reluctance with regard to everything strange their horror of the bad taste even of lively curiosity and in general the averseness of every distinguished and self-sufficing culture to avow a new desire a dissatisfaction with its own condition or an admiration of what is strange all this determines and disposes them unfavourably even towards the best things of the world which are not their property or could not become their prey and no faculty is more unintelligible to such men than just this historical sense with its truckling plebeian curiosity the case is not different with shakespeare that marvellous spanish moorish saxon synthesis of taste over whom an ancient athenian of the circle of aeschylus would have half killed himself with laughter or irritation but we accept precisely this wild motliness this medley of the most delicate the most coarse and the most artificial with a secret confidence and cordiality we enjoy it as a refinement of art reserved expressly for us and allow ourselves to be as little disturbed by the repulsive fumes and the proximity of the english populace in which shakespeare's art and taste lives as perhaps on the chiaia of naples where with all our senses awake we go our way enchanted and voluntarily in spite of the drain odour of the lower quarters of the town that as men of the historical sense we have our virtues is not to be disputed we are unpretentious unselfish modest brave habituated to self-control and self-renunciation very grateful very patient 
very complacent. But with all this we are perhaps not very tasteful. Let us finally confess it, that what is most difficult for us men of the historical sense to grasp, feel, taste and love, what finds us fundamentally prejudiced and almost hostile, is precisely the perfection and ultimate maturity in every culture and art, the essentially noble in works and men, their moment of smooth sea and halcyon self-sufficiency, the goldenness and coldness which all things show that have perfected themselves. Perhaps our great virtue of the historical sense is in necessary contrast to good taste, at least to the very best taste, and we can only evoke in ourselves imperfectly, hesitatingly, and with compulsion, the small, short and happy godsends and glorifications of human life as they shine here and there, those moments and marvellous experiences, when a great power has voluntarily come to a halt before the boundless and infinite, where a superabundance of refined delight has been enjoyed by a sudden checking and petrifying, by standing firmly and planting oneself fixedly on still trembling ground. Proportionateness is strange to us, let us confess it to ourselves. Our itching is really the itching for the infinite, the immeasurable. Like the rider on his forward panting horse, we let the reins fall before the infinite, we modern men, we semi-barbarians, and are only in our highest bliss when we are in most danger. 225. Whether it be hedonism, pessimism, utilitarianism, or eudaimonism, all those modes of thinking which measure the worth of things according to pleasure and pain, that is, according to accompanying circumstances and secondary considerations, are plausible modes of thought and naiveties, which every one conscious of creative powers and an artist's conscience will look down upon with scorn, though not without sympathy. Sympathy for you, to be sure, that is not sympathy as you understand it, it is not sympathy for social distress, for society with its sick and misfortuned, for the hereditarily vicious and defective who lie on the ground around us. Still less is it sympathy for the grumbling, vexed, revolutionary slave classes who strive after power, they call it freedom. Our sympathy is a loftier and further-sighted sympathy. We see how man dwarfs himself, how you dwarf him, and there are moments when we view your sympathy with an indescribable anguish, when we resist it, when we regard your seriousness as more dangerous than any kind of levity. You want, if possible, and there is not a more foolish if possible, to do away with suffering. And we? It really seems that we would rather have it increased and made worse than it has ever been. Well-being, as you understand it, is certainly not a goal. It seems to us an end, a condition which at once renders man ludicrous and contemptible, and makes his destruction desirable. The discipline of suffering, of great suffering, know ye not that it is only this discipline that has produced all the elevations of humanity hitherto? The tension of soul in misfortune, which communicates to it its energy, its shuddering in view of rack and ruin, its inventiveness and bravery in undergoing, enduring, interpreting and exploiting misfortune, and whatever depth, mystery, disguise, spirit, artifice or greatness has been bestowed upon the soul, has it not been bestowed through suffering? through the discipline of great suffering. In man, creature and creator are united. In man there is not only matter, shred, excess, clay, mire, folly, chaos, but there is also the creator, the sculptor, the hardness of the hammer, the divinity of the spectator, and the seventh day. Do ye understand this contrast? 
and that your sympathy for the creature in man applies to that which has to be fashioned, bruised, forged, stretched, roasted, annealed, refined, to that which must necessarily suffer, and is meant to suffer. And our sympathy, do ye not understand what our reverse sympathy applies to, when it resists your sympathy as the worst of all pampering and enervation? So it is sympathy against sympathy. But to repeat it once more, there are higher problems than the problems of pleasure and pain and sympathy, and all systems of philosophy which deal only with these are naiveties. 226. We Immoralists This world with which we are concerned, in which we have to fear and love, this almost invisible, inaudible world of delicate command and delicate obedience, a world of almost, in every respect, captitious, insidious, sharp and tender, yes, it is well protected from clumsy spectators and familiar curiosity. We are woven into a strong net and garment of duties, and cannot disengage ourselves. Precisely here we are men of duty, even we. Occasionally it is true we dance in our chains and betwixt our swords. It is none the less true that more often we gnash our teeth under the circumstances, and are impatient at the secret hardship of our lot. But do what we will, fools and appearances say of us, these are men without duty. We always have fools and appearances against us. 227 honesty, granting that it is the virtue from which we cannot rid ourselves, we free spirits, well, we will labour at it with all our perversity and love, and not tire of perfecting ourselves in our virtue, which alone remains. May its glance some day overspread, like a gilded, blue, mocking twilight, this ageing civilization with its dull, gloomy seriousness. And if, nevertheless, our honesty should one day grow weary and sigh, and stretch its limbs, and find us too hard, and would fain have it pleasanter, easier and gentler, like an agreeable vice, let us remain hard, we latest Stoics, and let us send to its help whatever devilry we have in us, our disgust at the clumsy and undefined, our nitima in vetitum, our love of adventure, our sharpened and fastidious curiosity, our most subtle, disguised, intellectual will to power and universal conquest, which rambles and roves avidiously around all the realms of the future. Let us go with all our devils to the help of our God. It is probable that people will misunderstand and mistake us on that account. What does it matter? They will say, their honesty, that is their devilry and nothing else. What does it matter? And even if they were right, have not all gods hitherto been such sanctified, rebaptized devils? And after all, what do we know of ourselves? And what the spirit that leads us wants to be called? It is a question of names. And how many spirits we harbour? Our honesty, we free spirits, let us be careful lest it become our vanity, our ornament and ostentation, our limitation, our stupidity. Every virtue inclines to stupidity, every stupidity to virtue. Stupid to the point of sanctity, they say in Russia. Let us be careful lest out of pure honesty we do not eventually become saints and bores. Is not life a hundred times too short for us? to bore ourselves. One would have to believe in eternal life in order to. 228. I hope to be forgiven for discovering that all moral philosophy hitherto has been tedious, and has belonged to the soporific appliances, and that virtue, in my opinion, has been more injured by the tediousness of its advocates than by anything else. 
At the same time, however, I would not wish to overlook their general usefulness. It is desirable that as few people as possible should reflect upon morals, and consequently it is very desirable that morals should not some day become interesting. But let us not be afraid. Things still remain today as they have always been. I see no one in Europe who has, or discloses, an idea of the fact that philosophizing concerning morals might be conducted in a dangerous, captitious and ensnaring manner, that calamity might be involved therein. Observe, for example, the indefatigable, inevitable English utilitarians, how ponderously and respectably they stalk on, stalk along, a Homeric metaphor expresses it better, in the footsteps of Bentham, just as he had already stalked in the footsteps of the respectable Helvicius. No, he was not a dangerous man, Helvicius, c'est senator poco curante, to use an expression of Galliani. No new thought, nothing of the nature of a finer tuning or better expression of an old thought, not even a proper history of what has previously been thought on the subject. An impossible literature, taking it all in all, unless one knows how to leaven it with some mischief. In effect, the old English vice called Kant, which is moral tartuffism, has insinuated itself also into these moralists, whom one must certainly read with an eye to their motives, if one must read them. Concealed this time under the new form of the scientific spirit, moreover, there is not absent from them a secret struggle with the pangs of conscience, from which a race of former Puritans must naturally suffer, in all their scientific tinkering with morals. Is not a moralist the opposite of a Puritan? That is to say, as a thinker who regards morality as questionable, as worthy of interrogation, in short, as a problem, is moralizing not immoral? In the end, they want all English morality to be recognized as authoritative, inasmuch as mankind, or the general utility, or the happiness of the greatest number, no, the happiness of England, will be best served thereby. They would like, by all means, to convince themselves that the striving after English happiness, I mean after comfort and fashion, and in the highest instance a seat in Parliament, is at the same time the true path of virtue, in fact, that in so far as there has been virtue in the world hitherto, it has just consisted in such striving. Not one of those ponderous, conscience-stricken, herding animals, who undertake to advocate the cause of egoism as conducive to the general welfare, wants to have any knowledge or inkling of the facts that the general welfare is no ideal, no goal, no notion that can be at all grasped but is only a nostrum, that what is fair to one may not at all be fair to another, that the requirement of one morality for all is really a detriment to higher men, in short, that there is a distinction of rank between man and man, and consequently between morality and morality. They are an unassuming and fundamentally mediocre species of men, these utilitarian Englishmen. and as already remarked, in so far as they are tedious, one cannot think highly enough of their utility. One ought even to encourage them, as has been partially attempted in the following rhymes. Hail, ye worthies, barrow-wheeling, longer, better, aye, revealing, stiffer eye in head and knee, unenraptured, never jesting, mediocre, everlasting, sans genie et sans esprit. 229. In these later ages, which may be proud of their humanity, there still remains so much fear, so much superstition of the fear, of the cruel wild beast, the mastering of which constitutes the very pride of these humaner ages, that even obvious truths, as if by the agreement of centuries, have long remained unuttered because they have the appearance of helping the finally slain wild beast back to life again. 
I perhaps risk something when I allow such a truth to escape. Let others capture it again and give it so much milk of pious sentiment to drink, that it will lie down quiet and forgotten in its old corner. One ought to learn anew about cruelty and open one's eyes. One ought at last to learn impatience, in order that such immodest gross errors, as, for instance, have been fostered by ancient and modern philosophers with regard to tragedy, may no longer wander about virtuously and boldly. Almost everything that we call higher culture is based upon the spiritualizing and intensifying of cruelty. This is my thesis. The wild beast has not been slain at all. It lives, it flourishes, it has only been transfigured. That which constitutes the painful delight of tragedy is cruelty. That which operates agreeably in so-called tragic sympathy, and at the basis even of everything sublime, up to the highest and most delicate thrills of metaphysics, obtains its sweetness solely from the intermingled ingredient of cruelty. What the Roman enjoys in the arena, the Christian in the ecstasies of the cross, the Spaniard at the sight of the faggot and stake, or of the bullfight, the present-day Japanese who presses his way to the tragedy, the workman of the Parisian suburbs who has a homesickness for bloody revolutions, the Wagnerian who, with unhinged will, undergoes the performance of Tristan and Isolde. What all these enjoy, and strive with mysterious ardour to drink in, is the filter of the great Circe cruelty. Here, to be sure, we must put aside entirely the blundering psychology of former times, which could only teach with regard to cruelty that it originated at the sight of the suffering of others. There is an abundant, superabundant enjoyment even in one's own suffering, in causing one's own suffering, and wherever man has allowed himself to be persuaded to self-denial in the religious sense, or to self-mutilation, as among the Phoenicians and ascetics, or, in general, to desensualization, decarnalization, and contrition, to puritanical repentance spasms, to vivisection of conscience, and to Pascal-like sacrificio dell'intelletto, he is secretly allured and impelled forwards by his cruelty, by the dangerous thrill of cruelty towards himself. Finally, let us consider that even the seeker of knowledge operates as an artist and glorifier of cruelty, in that he compels his spirit to perceive against its own inclination, and often enough against the wishes of his heart. He forces it to say nay, where he would like to affirm, love and adore. Indeed, every instance of taking a thing profoundly and fundamentally is a violation, an intentional injuring of the fundamental will of the spirit, which instinctively aims at appearance and superficiality. Even in every desire for knowledge there is a drop of cruelty. 230. Perhaps what I have here said about a fundamental will of the spirit may not be understood without further details. I may be allowed a word of explanation. That imperious something, which is popularly called the spirit, wishes to be master internally and externally, and to feel itself master. It has the will of a multiplicity for a simplicity, a binding, taming, imperious and essentially ruling will. Its requirements and capacities here are the same as those assigned by physiologists to everything that lives, grows and multiplies. The power of the spirit to appropriate foreign elements reveals itself in a strong tendency to assimilate the new to the old, to simplify the manifold, to overlook or repudiate the absolutely contradictory just as it arbitrarily re-underlines, makes prominent, and falsifies for itself certain traits and lines in the foreign elements, in every portion of the outside world. 
its object thereby is the incorporation of new experiences, the assortment of new things in the old arrangements, in short, growth, or, more properly, the feeling of growth, the feeling of increased power, is its object. This same will has, at its service, an apparently opposed impulse of the spirit, a suddenly adopted preference of ignorance, of arbitrary shutting out, a closing of windows, an inner denial of this or that, a prohibition to approach, a sort of defensive attitude against much that is knowable, a contentment with obscurity, with the shutting-in horizon, an acceptance and approval of ignorance, as that which is all necessary according to the degree of its appropriating power, its digestive power, to speak figuratively, and in fact the spirit resembles a stomach more than anything else. Here also belong an occasional propensity of the spirit to let itself be deceived, perhaps with a waggish suspicion that it is not so and so, but is only allowed to pass as such. A delight in uncertainty and ambiguity, an exulting enjoyment of arbitrary, out-of-the-way narrowness and mystery, of the too near, of the foreground, of the magnified, the diminished, the misshapen, the beautified, an enjoyment of the arbitrariness of all these manifestations of power. Finally, in this connection, there is the not unscrupulous readiness of the spirit to deceive other spirits and dissemble before them, the constant pressing and straining of a creating, shaping, changeable power, the spirit enjoys therein its craftiness and its variety of disguises, it enjoys also its feeling of security therein, it is precisely by its protean arts that it is best protected and concealed. Counter to this propensity for appearance, for simplification, for a disguise, for a cloak, in short for an outside, for every outside is a cloak, there operates the sublime tendency of the man of knowledge, which takes, and insists on taking things profoundly, variously and thoroughly, as a kind of cruelty of the intellectual conscience and taste which every courageous thinker will acknowledge in himself, provided, as it ought to be, that he has sharpened and hardened his eyes sufficiently long for introspection, and is accustomed to severe discipline and even severe words. He will say, there is something cruel in the tendency of my spirit. Let the virtuous and amiable try to convince him that it is not so. In fact, it would sound nicer if, instead of our cruelty, perhaps our extravagant honesty were talked about, whispered about and glorified. We free, very free spirits, and some day perhaps such will actually be our posthumous glory. Meanwhile, for there is plenty of time until then, we should be at least inclined to deck ourselves out in such florid and fringed moral verbiage. Our whole former work has just made us sick of this taste and its sprightly exuberance. They are beautiful, glistening, jingling, festive words, honesty, love of truth, love of wisdom, sacrifice for knowledge heroism of the truthful. There is something in them that makes one's heart swell with pride. But we anchorites and marmots have long ago persuaded ourselves in all the secrecy of an anchorite's conscience, that this worthy parade of verbiage also belongs to the old false adornment, frippery and gold-dust of unconscious human vanity, and that even under such flattering colour and repainting, the terrible original text, Homo Natura, must again be recognised. In effect, to translate man back again into nature, to master the many vain and visionary interpretations and subordinate meanings, which have hitherto been scratched and daubed over the eternal original text, Homo Natura, 
to bring it about that man shall henceforth stand before man as he now, hardened by the discipline of science, stands before the other forms of nature, with fearless Oedipus eyes and stopped Ulysses ears, deaf to the enticements of old metaphysical bird-catchers who have piped to him far too long. Thou art more, thou art higher, thou hast a different origin. This may be a strange and foolish task, but that it is a task, who can deny? Why did we choose it, this foolish task? Or, to put the question differently, why knowledge at all? Every one will ask us about this. And thus pressed, we, who have asked ourselves the question a hundred times, have not found, and cannot find, any better answer. 231. Learning alters us. It does what all nourishment does that does not merely conserve, as the physiologist knows. But at the bottom of our souls, quite down below, there is certainly something unteachable, a granite of spiritual fate, of predetermined decision and answer to predetermined chosen questions. In each cardinal problem there speaks an unchangeable, I am this. A thinker cannot learn anew about man and woman, for instance, but can only learn fully. He can only follow to the end of what is fixed about them in himself. Occasionally we find certain solutions of problems which make strong beliefs for us. Perhaps they are henceforth called convictions. Later on one sees in them only footsteps to self-knowledge, guideposts to the problem which we ourselves are, or, more correctly, to the great stupidity which we embody, our spiritual fate, the unteachable in us, quite down below. In view of this liberal compliment which I have just paid myself, permission will perhaps be more readily allowed me to utter some truths about woman as she is, provided that it is known at the outset how literally they are merely my truths. 232. Woman wishes to be independent, and therefore she begins to enlighten men about woman as she is. This is one of the worst developments of the general uglifying of Europe. For what must these clumsy attempts of feminine scientificality and self-exposure bring to light? Woman has so much cause for shame. In woman there is so much pedantry, superficiality, schoolmasterliness, petty presumption, unbridledness, and indiscretion concealed. Study only woman's behaviour towards children, which has really been best restrained and dominated hitherto by the fear of man. Alas, if ever the eternally tedious in woman—she has plenty of it— is allowed to venture forth. If she begins radically and on principle to unlearn her wisdom and art, of charming, of playing, of frightening away sorrow, of alleviating and taking easily, if she forgets her delicate aptitude for agreeable desires. Female voices are already raised, which, by St. Aristophanes, make one afraid. With medical explicitness it is stated in a threatening manner what woman first and last requires from man. Is it not in the very worst taste that woman thus sets herself up to be scientific? Enlightenment hitherto has fortunately been men's affair, men's gift. We remained therewith among ourselves. And in the end, in view of all that women write about woman, we may well have considerable doubt as to whether woman really desires enlightenment about herself, and can desire it. If woman does not thereby seek a new ornament for herself—I believe ornamentation belongs to the eternally feminine—why, then, she wishes to make herself feared? Perhaps she thereby wishes to get the mastery? But she does not want truth. What does woman care for truth? From the very first, nothing is more foreign, 
more repugnant or more hostile to woman than truth. Her great art is falsehood, her chief concern is appearance and beauty. Let us confess it, we men. We honour and love this very art and this very instinct in woman. We who have the hard task, and for our recreation gladly seek the company of beings, under whose hands, glances and delicate follies, our seriousness, our gravity and profundity, appear almost like follies to us. Finally I ask the question, did a woman herself ever acknowledge profundity in a woman's mind, or justice in a woman's heart? And is it not true that, on the whole, woman has hitherto been most despised by woman herself, and not at all by us? We men desire that woman should not continue to compromise herself by enlightening us. Just as it was man's care and the consideration for woman, when the Church decreed, mulier tassiat in ecclesia. It was to the benefit of woman when Napoleon gave the too eloquent Madame de Stael to understand, mulier tassiat in politicis, and, in my opinion, he is a true friend of woman who calls out to women to-day, mulier tassiat de mulier. 233. It betrays corruption of the instincts apart from the fact that it betrays bad taste, when a woman refers to Madame Roland, or Madame de Stael, or Monsieur Georges Sand, as though something were proved thereby in favour of woman as she is. Among men, these are the three comical women as they are, nothing more, and just the best involuntary counter-arguments against feminine emancipation and autonomy. 234. Stupidity in the kitchen, woman as cook, the terrible thoughtlessness with which the feeding of the family and the master of the house is managed. Woman does not understand what food means, and she insists on being cook. If woman had been a thinking creature, she should certainly, as cook for thousands of years, have discovered the most important physiological facts, and should likewise have got possession of the healing art through bad female cooks, through the entire lack of reason in the kitchen, the development of mankind has been longest retarded and most interfered with, even today matters a very little better. A word to high school girls. 235. There are turns and casts of fancy, there are sentences, little handfuls of words, in which a whole culture, a whole society suddenly crystallises itself. Among these is the incidental remark of Madame de Lambert to her son. Mon ami, ne vous permettez jamais coup de folie, qui vous feront grand plaisir. The motherliest and wisest remark, by the way, that was ever addressed to a son. 236. I have no doubt that every noble woman will oppose what Dante and Goethe believed about woman, the former when he sang, Ella guardava suso, adio in lei, and the latter when he interpreted it, the eternally feminine draws us aloft, for this is just what she believes of the eternally masculine. 237. Seven apothems for women. How the longest ennui flees, when a man comes to our knees. Age, alas, and science stayed, furnish even weak virtue aid. Sombre garb and silence meet, dress for every dame discreet. Whom I thank when in my bliss, God and my good tailoress. Young, a flower-decked cavern home, Old, a dragon thence doth roam. Noble title, leg that's fine, Man as well, oh, were he mine. Speech in brief and sense in mass, Slippery for the jenny ass. 237a. Woman has hitherto been treated by men like birds, Which, losing their way, 
have come down among them from an elevation, as something delicate, fragile, wild, strange, sweet and animating, but as something also which must be cooped up to prevent it flying away. 238. To be mistaken in the fundamental problem of man and woman, to deny here the profoundest antagonism and the necessity for an eternally hostile tension, to dream here perhaps of equal rights, equal training, equal claims and obligations, that is a typical sign of shallow-mindedness, and a thinker who has proved himself shallow at this dangerous spot, shallow in instinct, may generally be regarded as suspicious, nay more, as betrayed, as discovered. He will probably prove too short for all fundamental questions of life, future as well as present, and will be unable to descend into any of the depths. On the other hand, a man who has depth of spirit as well as of desires, and has also the depth of benevolence which is capable of severity and harshness, and easily confounded with them, can only think of woman as Orientals do. He must conceive of her as a possession, as confinable property, as a being predestined for service and accomplishing her mission therein. He must take his stand in this matter upon the immense rationality of Asia, upon the superiority of the instinct of Asia, as the Greeks did formerly, those best heirs and scholars of Asia, who, as is well known, with their increasing culture and amplitude of power, from Homer to the time of Pericles, became gradually stricter towards woman, in short, more oriental. How necessary, how logical, even how humanely desirable this was, let us consider for ourselves. 239. The weaker sex has in no previous age been treated with so much respect by men as at present. This belongs to the tendency and fundamental taste of democracy, in the same way as disrespectfulness to old age. What wonder is it that abuse should immediately be made of this respect? They want more. They learn to make claims. The tribute of respect is at last felt to be well-nigh galling. Rivalry for rights, indeed actual strife itself, would be preferred. In a word, woman is losing modesty. And let us immediately add that she is also losing taste. She is unlearning to fear man. But the woman who unlearns to fear sacrifices her most womanly instincts. That woman should venture forward when the fear-inspiring quality in man, or more definitely the man in man, is no longer either desired or fully developed, is reasonable enough and also intelligible enough. What is more difficult to understand is that precisely thereby woman deteriorates. This is what is happening nowadays. Let us not deceive ourselves about it. Wherever the industrial spirit has triumphed over the military and aristocratic spirit, woman strives for the economic and legal independence of a clerk. Woman as clerkess is inscribed on the portal of the modern society which is in course of formation. While she thus appropriates new rights, aspires to be master, and inscribes progress of woman on her flags and banners, the very opposite realises itself with terrible obviousness. Woman retrogrades. Since the French Revolution, the influence of woman in Europe has declined in proportion as she has increased her rights and claims, and the emancipation of woman, in so far as it is desired and demanded by women themselves, and not only by masculine shallowpates, thus proves to be a remarkable symptom of the increased weakening and deadening of the most womanly instincts. There is stupidity in this movement, an almost masculine stupidity, of which a well-reared woman, who is always a sensible woman, might be heartily ashamed. To lose the intuition as to the ground upon which she can most surely achieve victory, to neglect exercise in the use of her proper weapons, to let herself go before man, perhaps even to the book, 
where formerly she kept herself in control and in refined, artful humility, to neutralise with her virtuous audacity man's faith in a veiled, fundamentally different ideal in woman, something eternally, necessarily feminine, to emphatically and loquaciously dissuade man from the idea that woman must be preserved, cared for, protected and indulged, like some delicate, strangely wild and often pleasant domestic animal. The clumsy and indignant collection of everything of the nature of servitude and bondage, which the position of woman in the hitherto existing order of society has entailed, and still entails, as though slavery were a counter-argument, and not rather a condition of every higher culture, of every elevation of culture. What does all this betoken, if not a disintegration of womanly instincts, a de-feminizing? Certainly there are enough of idiotic friends and corruptors of woman, amongst the learned asses of the masculine sex, who advise woman to de-feminize herself in this manner, and to imitate all the stupidities from which man, in Europe, European manliness, suffers, who would like to lower woman to general culture, indeed even to newspaper reading and meddling with politics. Here and there they wish even to make women into free spirits and literary workers, as though a woman without piety would not be something perfectly obnoxious or ludicrous to a profound and godless man. Almost everywhere her nerves are being ruined by the most morbid and dangerous kind of music, our latest German music, and she is daily being made more hysterical and more incapable of fulfilling her first and last function, that of bearing robust children. They wish to cultivate her in general still more, and intend, as they say, to make the weaker sex strong by culture, as if history did not teach in the most emphatic manner that the cultivating of mankind and his weakening, that is to say, the weakening, dissipating and languishing of his force of will, have always kept pace with one another, and that the most powerful and influential women in the world, and lastly the mother of Napoleon, had just to thank their force of will, and not their schoolmasters, for their power and ascendancy over men. That which inspires respect in woman, and often enough fear also, is her nature, which is more natural than that of man, her genuine, carnivora-like, cunning flexibility, her tiger-claws beneath the glove, her naivety and egoism, her untrainableness and innate wildness, the incomprehensibleness, extent and deviation of her desires and virtues, that which, in spite of fear, excites one's sympathy for the dangerous and beautiful cat, woman, is that she seems more afflicted, more vulnerable, more necessitous of love, and more condemned to disillusionment than any other creature. Fear and sympathy, it is with these feelings that man has hitherto stood in presence of woman, always with one foot already in tragedy, which rends while it delights. What? And all that is now to be at an end? And the disenchantment of woman is in progress? The tediousness of woman is slowly evolving. Oh, Europe, Europe, we know the horned animal which was always most attractive to thee, from which danger is ever again threatening thee. Thy old fable might once more become history, an immense stupidity might once again overmaster thee and carry thee away. And no god concealed beneath it, no, only an idea, a modern idea. End of chapter 7Chapter Eight of Beyond Good and Evil by Friedrich Nietzsche. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eighth Chapter Peoples and Countries. Two hundred and forty. I heard, once again for the first time, Richard Wagner's overture to the Master Singers. It is a piece of magnificent, gorgeous, heavy, latter day art which has the pride to presuppose two centuries of music as still living, in order that it may be understood. 
it is an honour to Germans that such a pride did not miscalculate. What flavours and forces, what seasons and climes do we not find mingled in it? It impresses us at one time as ancient, at another time as foreign, bitter and too modern. It is as arbitrary as it is pompously traditional. It is not infrequently roguish, still oftener rough and coarse. It has fire and courage, and, at the same time, the loose dun-coloured skin of fruits which ripen too late. It flows broad and full, and suddenly there is a moment of inexplicable hesitation, like a gap that opens between cause and effect, an oppression that makes us dream, almost a nightmare. But already it broadens and widens anew the old stream of delight, the most manifold delight, of old and new happiness, including especially the joy of the artist in himself, which he refuses to conceal, his astonished, happy cognizance of his mastery of the expedients here employed, the new, newly acquired, imperfectly tested expedients of art, as he apparently betrays to us. All in all, however, no beauty, no south, nothing of the delicate southern clearness of the sky, nothing of grace, no dance, hardly a will for logic, a certain clumsiness even, which is also emphasised, as though the artist wished to say to us, it is part of my intention. A cumbersome drapery, something arbitrarily barbaric and ceremonious, a flurring of learned and venerable conceits and witticisms, something German in the best and worst sense of the word, something in the German style, manifold, formless and inexhaustible, a certain German potency and superplenitude of soul, which is not afraid to hide itself under the raffinement of decadence, which, perhaps, feels itself most at ease there, a real genuine token of the German soul, which is at the same time young and aged, too ripe and yet still too rich in futurity. This kind of music expresses best what I think of the Germans. They belong to the day before yesterday and the day after tomorrow. They have as yet no today. 241. We, good Europeans, we also have hours when we allow ourselves a warm-hearted patriotism, a plunge and relapse into old loves and narrow views. I have just given an example of it. Hours of national excitement, of patriotic anguish, and all other sorts of old-fashioned floods of sentiment. Duller spirits than we may only get done with what confines its operations in us to hours and plays itself out in hours, in a considerable time, some in half a year, others in half a lifetime, according to the speed and strength with which they digest and change their material. Indeed, I could think of sluggish, hesitating races, which, even in our rapidly moving Europe, would require half a century ere they could surmount such atavistic attacks of patriotism and soil attachment, and return once more to reason, that is to say, to good Europeanism. And while digressing on this possibility, I happen to become an ear-witness of a conversation between two old patriots. They were evidently both hard of hearing, and consequently spoke all the louder. He has as much, and knows as much, philosophy as a peasant or core student, said the one. He is still innocent. But what does that matter nowadays? It is the age of the masses. They lie on their belly before everything that is massive. And so also in politicis. A statesman who rears up for them a new tower of Babel, some monstrosity of empire and power, they call great. What does it matter that we more prudent and conservative ones do not meanwhile give up the old belief that it is only the great thought that gives greatness to an action or affair? 
supposing a statesman were to bring his people into the position of being obliged henceforth to practice high politics, for which they were by nature badly endowed and prepared, so that they would have to sacrifice their old and reliable virtues out of love to a new and doubtful mediocrity. Supposing a statesman were to condemn his people generally to practice politics, when they have hitherto had something better to do and think about, and when, in the depths of their souls, they have been unable to free themselves from a prudent loathing of the restlessness, emptiness, and noisy wranglings of the essentially politics-practising nations. Supposing such a statesman were to stimulate the slumbering passions and avidities of his people, were to make a stigma out of their former diffidence and delight in aloofness, an offence out of their exoticism and hidden permanency, were to depreciate their most radical proclivities, subvert their consciences, make their minds narrow and their tastes national. What! A statesman who should do all this, which his people would have to do penance for throughout their whole future, if they had a future, such a statesman would be great, wouldn't he?" Undoubtedly, replied the other old patriot vehemently. Otherwise he could not have done it. It was mad, perhaps, to wish such a thing. But perhaps everything great has just been mad at its commencement. Misuse of words, cried his interlocutor, contradictorily. Strong, strong, strong and mad, not great. The old men had obviously become heated as they thus shouted their truths in each other's faces. But I, in my happiness and apartness, considered how soon a stronger one will become master of the strong, and also that there is a compensation for the intellectual superficialising of a nation, namely in the deepening of another. 242. Whether we call it civilization or humanizing, or progress, which now distinguishes the European, whether we call it simply, without praise or blame, by the political formula, the democratic movement in Europe. Behind all the moral and political foregrounds pointed to by such formulas, an immense physiological process goes on, which is ever-extending, the process of the assimilation of Europeans their increasing detachment from the conditions under which, climatically and hereditarily, united races originate, their increasing independence of every definite milieu, that for centuries would fain inscribe itself with equal demands on soul and body, that is to say, the slow emergence of an essentially supernational and nomadic species of man, who possesses, physiologically speaking, a maximum of the art and power of adaptation as his typical distinction. This process of the evolving European, which can be retarded in its tempo by great relapses, but will perhaps just gain and grow thereby in vehemence and depth, the still raging storm and stress of national sentiment pertains to it, and also the anarchism which is appearing at present. This process will probably arrive at results on which its naive propagators and panegyrists, the apostles of modern ideas, would least care to reckon. The same new conditions under which, on average, a levelling and mediocrising of man will take place, a useful, industrious, variously serviceable and clever herd-animal like man, are in the highest degree suitable to give rise to exceptional men of the most dangerous and attractive qualities. For, while the capacity for adaptation, which is ever trying changing conditions, and begins a new work with every generation, almost with every decade, makes the powerfulness of the type impossible, while the collective impression of such future Europeans will probably be that of numerous, talkative, weak-willed, and very handy workmen, who require a master, a commander, as they require their daily bread. While, therefore, 
the democratizing of Europe will tend to the production of a type prepared for slavery, in the most subtle sense of the term. The strong man will necessarily, in individual and exceptional cases, become stronger and richer than he has perhaps ever been before, owing to the unprejudicedness of his schooling, owing to the immense variety of practice, art and disguise. I meant to say that the democratizing of Europe is at the same time an involuntary arrangement for the rearing of tyrants, taking the word in all its meanings, even in its most spiritual sense. 243. I hear with pleasure that our sun is moving rapidly towards the constellation Hercules, and I hope that the men on this earth will do like the sun, and we foremost, we good Europeans. 244. There was a time when it was customary to call Germans deep by way of distinction. But now that the most successful type of new Germanism is covetous of quite other honours, and perhaps misses smartness in all that has depth, it is almost opportune and patriotic to doubt whether we did not formally deceive ourselves with that commendation. In short, whether German depth is not at bottom something different and worse, and something from which, thank God, we are on the point of successfully ridding ourselves. Let us try, then, to relearn with regard to German depth. The only thing necessary for the purpose is a little vivisection of the German soul. The German soul is above all manifold, varied in its source, aggregated and superimposed rather than actually built. This is owing to its origin. A German who would embolden himself to assert, two souls, alas, dwell in my breast, would make a bad guess at the truth, or, more correctly, he would come up far short of the truth about the number of souls. As a people made up of the most extraordinary mixing and mingling of races, perhaps even with a preponderance of the pre-Aryan element, as the people of the centre in every sense of the term, the Germans are more intangible, more ample, more contradictory, more unknown, more incalculable, more surprising, and even more terrifying than other peoples are to themselves. They escape definition, and are thereby alone the despair of the French. It is characteristic of the Germans that the question, what is German, never dies out among them. Kotzebue certainly knew his Germans well enough. We are known, they cried jubilantly to him, but Sand also thought he knew them. Jean-Paul knew what he was doing when he declared himself incensed at Fichte's lying but patriotic flatteries and exaggerations. But it is probable that Goethe thought differently about Germans from Jean-Paul, even though he acknowledged him to be right with regard to Fichte. It is a question what Goethe really thought about the Germans. But about many things around him he never spoke explicitly, and all his life he knew how to keep an astute silence. Probably he had good reason for it. It is certain that it was not the wars of independence that made him look up more joyfully, any more than it was the French Revolution, the event on account of which he reconstructed his Faust, and indeed the whole problem of man, was the appearance of Napoleon. There are words of Goethe in which he condemns with impatient severity, as from a foreign land, that which Germans take a pride in. He once defined the famous German turn of mind as indulgence towards its own and others' weaknesses. Was he wrong? It is characteristic of Germans that one is seldom entirely wrong about them. The German soul has passages and galleries in it. There are caves, hiding-places and dungeons therein. Its disorder has much of the charm of the mysterious. The German is well acquainted with the bypaths to chaos. And, as everything loves its symbol, so the German loves the clouds and all that is obscure, evolving, crepuscular, damp and shrouded. 
it seems to him that everything uncertain, undeveloped, self-displacing and growing, is deep. The German himself does not exist. He is becoming, he is developing himself. Development is, therefore, the essentially German discovery and hit in the great domain of philosophical formulas, a ruling idea which, together with German beer and German music, is labouring to Germanize all Europe. Foreigners are astonished and attracted by the riddles which the conflicting nature at the basis of the German soul propounds to them, riddles which Hegel systematised, and Richard Wagner has in the end set to music. Good-natured and spiteful. Such a juxtaposition, preposterous in the case of every other people, is unfortunately only too often justified in Germany. One has only to live for a while among Swabians to know this. The clumsiness of the German scholar and his social distastefulness agree alarmingly well with his psychical robe-dancing and nimble boldness, of which all the gods have learned to be afraid. If any one wishes to see the German soul demonstrated ad oculus, let him only look at German taste, at German arts and manners. What boorish indifference to taste! How the noblest and the commonest stand there in juxtaposition! How disorderly and how rich is the whole constitution of this soul! The German drags at his soul, he drags at everything he experiences. He digests his events badly, he never gets done with them, and German depth is often only a difficult, hesitating digestion. And just as all chronic invalids, all dyspeptics, like what is convenient, so the German loves frankness and honesty. It is so convenient to be frank and honest. This confidingness, this complacence, this showing the cards of German honesty, is probably the most dangerous and most successful disguise which the German is up to nowadays. It is his proper Mephistophelian art. With this he can still achieve much. The German lets himself go, and thereby gazes with faithful, blue, empty German eyes, and other countries immediately confound him with his dressing-gown. I meant to say that, let German depth be what it will, among ourselves alone we perhaps take the liberty to laugh at it. We shall do well to continue henceforth to honour its appearance and good name, and not barter away too cheaply our old reputation as a people of depth for Prussian smartness and Berlin wit and sand. It is wise for a people to pose, and let itself be regarded as profound, clumsy, good-natured, honest and foolish. It might even be profound to do so. Finally, we should do honour to our name. We are not called the Tuschevolk, deceptive people, for nothing. 245. The good old time is past. It sang itself out in Mozart. How happy are we that his Rococo still speaks to us, that his good company, his tender enthusiasm, his childish delight in the Chinese and in flourishes, his courtesy of heart, his longing for the elegant, the amorous, the tripping, the tearful, and his belief in the South, can still appeal to something left in us. Ah, some time or other it will be over with it, but who can doubt that it will be over still sooner with the intelligence and taste for Beethoven? For he was only the last echo of a break and transition in style, and not, like Mozart, the last echo of a great European taste which had existed for centuries. Beethoven is the intermediate event between an old mellow soul that is constantly breaking down, and a future over-young soul that is always coming. There is spread over his music the twilight of eternal loss and eternal extravagant hope, the same light in which Europe was bathed when it dreamed with Rousseau, when it danced round the tree of liberty of the revolution, and finally almost fell down in adoration before Napoleon. 
But how rapidly does this very sentiment now pale! How difficult nowadays is even the apprehension of this sentiment! How strangely does the language of Rousseau, Schiller, Shelley, and Byron sound to our ear, in whom collectively the same fate of Europe was able to speak, which knew how to sing in Beethoven! Whatever German music came afterwards belongs to Romanticism, that is to say, to a movement which, historically considered, was still shorter, more fleeting, and more superficial than that great interlude, the transition of Europe from Rousseau to Napoleon, and to the rise of democracy. Weber. But what do we care nowadays for Freischutz and Oberon, or Marschner's Hans Heiling and Vampire? or even Wagner's Tannhauser. That is extinct, although not yet forgotten, music. This whole music of Romanticism, besides, was not noble enough, was not musical enough, to maintain its position anywhere but in the theatre and before the masses. From the beginning it was second-rate music, which was little thought of by genuine musicians. It was different with Felix Mendelssohn, that halcyon master, who, on account of his lighter, purer, happier soul, quickly acquired admiration, and was equally quickly forgotten, as the beautiful episode of German music. But with regard to Robert Schumann, who took things seriously, and has been taken seriously from the first, he was the last that founded a school. Do we not now regard it as a satisfaction, a relief? a deliverance, that this very romanticism of Schumann's has been surmounted. Schumann, fleeing into the Saxon Switzerland of his soul, with a half furter like half Jean-Paul-like nature, assuredly not like Beethoven, assuredly not like Byron. His Manfred music is a mistake and a misunderstanding to the extent of injustice. Schumann, with his taste, which was fundamentally a petty taste, that is to say, a dangerous propensity, doubly dangerous among Germans, for quiet lyricism and intoxication of the feelings. Going constantly apart, timidly withdrawing and retiring, a noble weakling who revelled in nothing but anonymous joy and sorrow, from the beginning a sort of girl and noli me tangere, this Schumann was already merely a German event in music, and no longer a European event, as Beethoven had been, as in a still greater degree Mozart had been. With Schumann, German music was threatened with its greatest danger, that of losing the voice for the soul of Europe, and sinking into a merely national affair. 246. What a torture are books written in German to a reader who has a third ear! How indignantly he stands beside the slowly turning swamp of sounds without tune and rhythms without dance, which Germans call a book! And even the German who reads books! How lazily, how reluctantly, how badly he reads! How many Germans know, and consider it obligatory to know, that there is art in every good sentence, art which must be divined if the sentence is to be understood? If there is a misunderstanding about its tempo, for instance, the sentence itself is misunderstood. That one must not be too doubtful about the rhythm-determining syllables, that one should feel the breaking of the too rigid symmetry as intentional and as a charm, that one should lend a fine and patient ear to every staccato and every rubato, that one should divine the sense in the sequence of the vowels and diphthongs, and how delicately and richly they can be tinted and retinted in the order of their arrangement. Who among book-reading Germans is complacent enough to recognise such duties and requirements, and to listen to so much art and intention in language? After all, one just has no ear for it, and so the most marked contrasts of style are not heard, and the most delicate artistry is, as it were, squandered on the deaf. These were my thoughts, when I noticed how clumsily and unintuitively two masters in the art of prose-writing have been confounded. One whose words drop down hesitatingly and coldly, as from the roof of a damp cave, he counts on their dull sound and echo. 
and another who manipulates his language like a flexible sword, and from his arm down into his toes feels the dangerous bliss of the quivering, over-sharp blade, which wishes to bite, hiss, and cut. 247. How little the German style has to do with harmony and with the ear is shown by the fact that precisely our good musicians themselves write badly. The German does not read aloud, he does not read for the ear, but only with his eyes, he has put his ears away in the drawer for the time. In antiquity, when a man read, which was seldom enough, he read something to himself and in a loud voice. They were surprised when any one read silently and sought secretly the reason of it. In a loud voice, that is to say, with all the swellings, inflections and variations of key and changes of tempo in which the ancient public world took delight. The laws of the written style were then the same as those of the spoken style, and these laws depended partly on the surprising development and refined requirements of the ear and larynx, partly on the strength, endurance and power of the ancient lungs. In the ancient sense, a period is, above all, a physiological whole, inasmuch as it is comprised in one breath. Such periods as occur in Demosthenes and Cicero, swelling twice and sinking twice and all in one breath, were pleasures to the men of antiquity, who knew by their own schooling how to appreciate the virtue therein the rareness and the difficulty in the deliverance of such a period. We have really no right to the big period, we modern men, who are short of breath in every sense. Those ancients, indeed, were all of them dilettanti in speaking, consequently connoisseurs, consequently critics, they thus brought their orators to the highest pitch. In the same manner as in the last century, when all Italian ladies and gentlemen knew how to sing, the virtuoso-ship of song, and with it also the art of melody, reached its elevation. In Germany, however, until quite recently, when a kind of platform eloquence began shyly and awkwardly enough to flutter its young wings, there was, properly speaking, only one kind of public and approximately artistical discourse, that delivered from the pulpit. The preacher was the only one in Germany who knew the weight of a syllable or a word. In what manner a sentence strikes, springs, rushes, flows and comes to a close. He alone had a conscience in his ears, often enough a bad conscience, for reasons are not lacking why proficiency in oratory should be especially seldom attained by a German, or almost always too late. The masterpiece of German prose is therefore with good reason the masterpiece of its greatest preacher. The Bible has hitherto been the best German book. Compared with Luther's Bible, almost everything else is merely literature, something which has not grown in Germany, and therefore has not taken, and does not take, root in German hearts, as the Bible has done. 248. There are two kinds of geniuses, one which above all engenders and seeks to engender, and another which willingly lets itself be fructified and brings forth. And similarly, among the gifted nations, there are those on whom the woman's problem of pregnancy has devolved, and the secret task of forming, maturing, and perfecting. The Greeks, for instance, were a nation of this kind, and so are the French and others which have to fructify and become the cause of new modes of life, like the Jews, the Romans, and, in all modesty be it asked, like the Germans? Nations tortured and enraptured by unknown fevers, and irresistibly forced out of themselves, amorous and longing for foreign races, for such as let themselves be fructified, and withal imperious, like everything conscious of being full of generative force, and consequently empowered by the grace of God. These two kinds of geniuses seek each other like man and woman, but they also misunderstand each other like man and woman. 249. 
Every nation has its own tartuffery, and calls that its virtue. One does not know, cannot know, the best that is in one. 250. What Europe owes to the Jews? Many things, good and bad, and above all one thing of the nature both of the best and the worst, the grand style in morality, the fearfulness and majesty of infinite demands, of infinite significations, the whole romanticism and sublimity of moral questionableness, and consequently just the most attractive, ensnaring and exquisite element in those iridescences and allurements to life, in the after-sheen of which the sky of our European culture, its evening sky, now glows, perhaps glows out. For this, we artists among the spectators and philosophers, are grateful to the Jews. 251. It must be taken into the bargain, if various clouds and disturbances, in short, slight attacks of stupidity, pass over the spirit of a people that suffers, and wants to suffer, from national nervous fever and political ambition. For instance, among present-day Germans, there is alternately the anti-French folly, the anti-Semitic folly, the anti-Polish folly, the Christian romantic folly, the Wagnerian folly, the Teutonic folly, the Prussian folly. Just look at those poor historians, the Sibyls and Treitschkes, and their closely bandaged heads, and whatever else these little obscurations of the German spirit and conscience may be called. May it be forgiven me that I too, when on a short, daring sojourn on very infected ground, did not remain wholly exempt from the disease, but, like every one else, began to entertain thoughts about matters which did not concern me, the first symptom of political infection. About the Jews, for instance, listen to the following. I have never yet met a German who was favourably inclined to the Jews, and however decided the repudiation of actual anti-Semitism may be, on the part of all prudent and political men, this prudence and policy is not perhaps directed against the nature of the sentiment itself, but only against its dangerous excess, and especially against the distasteful and infamous expression of this excess of sentiment. On this point we must not deceive ourselves. That Germany has amply sufficient Jews, that the German stomach, the German blood, has difficulty, and will long have difficulty, in disposing only of this quantity of Jew, as the Italian, the Frenchman, and the Englishman have done by means of a stronger digestion, that is the unmistakable declaration and language of a general instinct, to which one must listen and according to which one must act. Let no more Jews come in, and shut the doors, especially towards the east, also towards Austria. Thus commands the instinct of a people whose nature is still feeble and uncertain, so that it could be easily wiped out, easily extinguished by a stronger race. The Jews, however, are beyond all doubt the strongest, toughest and purest race at present living in Europe. They know how to succeed even under the worst conditions, in fact better than under favourable ones, by means of virtues of some sort, which one would like nowadays to label as vices, owing above all to a resolute faith, which does not need to be ashamed before modern ideas. They alter only when they do alter, in the same way that the Russian Empire makes its conquest, as an empire that has plenty of time and is not of yesterday, namely, according to the principle, as slowly as possible. A thinker who has the future of Europe at heart will, in all his perspectives concerning the future, calculate upon the Jews, as he will calculate upon the Russians, as above all the surest and likeliest factors in the great play and battle of forces. That which is at present called a nation in Europe, and is really rather a res factor than nata, indeed sometimes confusingly similar to a res ficta et picta, is in every case something evolving, 
young, easily displaced, and not yet a race, much less such a race, or a perennius, as the Jews are. Such nations should most carefully avoid all hot-headed rivalry and hostility. It is certain that the Jews, if they desired, or if they were driven to it, as the anti-Semites seem to wish, could now have the ascendancy, nay, literally the supremacy, over Europe. That they are not working and planning for that end is equally certain. Meanwhile, they rather wish and desire, even somewhat importunately, to be insorbed and absorbed by Europe. They long to be finally settled, authorised and respected somewhere, and wish to put an end to the nomadic life, to the wandering Jew. And one should certainly take account of this impulse and tendency, and make advances to it. It possibly betokens a mitigation of the Jewish instincts for which purpose it would perhaps be useful and fair to banish the anti-Semitic ballers out of the country. One should make advances with all prudence and with selection, pretty much as the English nobility do. It stands to reason that the more powerful and strongly marked types of new Germanism could enter into relation with the Jews with the least hesitation. For instance, the nobleman officer from the Prussian border, it would be interesting in many ways to see whether the genius for money and patience, and especially some intellect and intellectuality, sadly lacking in the place referred to, could not in addition be annexed and trained to the hereditary art of commanding and obeying, for both of which the country in question has now a classic reputation. But here it is expedient to break off my festal discourse and my sprightly Teutonomania, for I have already reached my serious topic, the European problem as I understand it, the rearing of a new ruling caste for Europe. 252. They are not a philosophical race, the English. Bacon represents an attack on the philosophical spirit generally. Hobbes, Hume and Locke, an abasement, and a depreciation of the idea of a philosopher for more than a century. It was against Hume that Kant uprose and raised himself. It was Locke of whom Schelling rightly said, Je m'emprise Locke. In the struggle against the English mechanical stultification of the world, Hegel and Schopenhauer, along with Goethe, were of one accord, the two hostile brother geniuses in philosophy who pushed in different directions towards the opposite poles of German thought, and thereby wronged each other as only brothers will do. What is lacking in England, and has always been lacking, that half-actor and rhetorician knew well enough, the absurd muddlehead Carlyle, who sought to conceal under passionate grimaces what he knew about himself, namely what was lacking in Carlyle, real power of intellect, real depth of intellectual perception, in short, philosophy. It is characteristic of such an unphilosophical race to hold on firmly to Christianity. They need its discipline for moralising and humanising. The Englishman, more gloomy, sensual, headstrong and brutal than the German, is, for that very reason, as the baser of the two, also the most pious, he has all the more need of Christianity. To finer nostrils, this English Christianity itself still has a characteristic English taint of spleen and alcoholic excess, for which, owing to good reasons, it is used as an antidote, the finer poison to neutralise the coarser. A finer form of poisoning is in fact a step in advance with coarse-mannered people, a step towards spiritualization. The English coarseness and rustic demureness is still most satisfactorily disguised by Christian pantomime, and by praying and psalm-singing, or, more correctly, it is thereby explained and differently expressed. And for the herd of drunkards and rakes, who formerly learned moral grunting under the influence of Methodism, and more recently as the Salvation Army, 
a penitential fit may really be the relatively highest manifestation of humanity to which they can be elevated. So much may reasonably be admitted. That, however, which offends even in the humanest Englishman, is his lack of music, to speak figuratively, and also literally. He has neither rhythm nor dance in the movements of his soul and body. Indeed, not even the desire for rhythm and dance, for music. Listen to him speaking. Look at the most beautiful English women walking. In no country on earth are there more beautiful doves and swans. Finally, listen to them singing. But I ask too much. 253. There are truths which are best recognised by mediocre minds, because they are best adapted for them. There are truths which only possess charms and seductive power for mediocre spirits. One is pushed to this probably unpleasant conclusion, now that the influence of respectable but mediocre Englishmen, I may mention Darwin, John Stuart Mill, and Herbert Spencer, begins to gain the ascendancy in the middle-class region of European taste. Indeed, who could doubt that it is a useful thing for such minds to have the ascendancy for a time? It would be an error to consider the highly developed and independently soaring minds as specially qualified for determining and collecting many little common facts and deducing conclusions from them. As exceptions, they are rather from the first in no very favourable position towards those who are the rules. After all, they have more to do than merely to perceive. In effect, they have to be something new. They have to signify something new. They have to represent new values. The gulf between knowledge and capacity is perhaps greater, and also more mysterious, than one thinks. The capable man in the grand style, the creator, will possibly have to be an ignorant person. While, on the other hand, for scientific discoveries like those of Darwin, a certain narrowness, aridity, and industrious carefulness, in short something English, may not be unfavourable for arriving at them. Finally, let it not be forgotten that the English, with their profound mediocrity, brought about once before a general depression of European intelligence. What is called modern ideas, or the ideas of the eighteenth century, or French ideas, that, consequently against which the German mind rose up with profound disgust, is of English origin, there is no doubt about it. The French were only the apes and actors of these ideas, their best soldiers, and likewise, alas, their first and profoundest victims. For owing to the diabolical Anglomania of modern ideas, the homme francais has, in the end, become so thin and emaciated that at present one recalls its sixteenth and seventeenth centuries, its profound passionate strength, its inventive excellency, almost with disbelief. One must, however, maintain this verdict of historical justice in a determined manner and defend it against present prejudices and appearances. The European noblesse, of sentiment, taste, and manners, taking the word in every high sense, is the work and invention of France. The European ignobleness, the plebeianism of modern ideas, is England's work and invention. 254. Even at present, France is still the seat of the most intellectual and refined culture of Europe. It is still the high school of taste. But one must know how to find this France of taste. He who belongs to it keeps himself well concealed. They may be a small number in whom it lives and is embodied, besides perhaps being men who do not stand upon the strongest legs, in part fatalists, hypochondriacs, invalids, in part persons over-indulged, over-refined, such as have the ambition to conceal themselves. They have all something in common. They keep their ears closed in presence of the delirious folly and noisy spouting of the democratic bourgeois. In fact, 
a besotted and brutalized France at present sprawls in the foreground. It recently celebrated a veritable orgy of bad taste, and, at the same time, of self-admiration, at the funeral of Victor Hugo. There is also something else common to them, a predilection to resist intellectual Germanizing, and a still greater inability to do so. In this France of intellect, which is also a France of pessimism, Schopenhauer has perhaps become more at home and more indigenous than he has ever been in Germany, not to speak of Heinrich Hein, who has long ago been reincarnated in the more refined and fastidious lyrists of Paris, or of Hegel, who at present, in the form of Taine, the first of living historians, exercises an almost tyrannical influence. As regards Richard Wagner, however, the more French music learns to adapt itself to the actual needs of the homme moderne, the more will it Wagnerize. One can safely predict that beforehand, it is already taking place sufficiently. There are, however, three things which the French can still boast of with pride as their heritage and possession, and as indelible tokens of their ancient intellectual superiority in Europe, in spite of all voluntary or involuntary Germanizing and vulgarizing of taste. Firstly, the capacity for artistic emotion, for devotion to form, for which the expression l'art pour l'art, along with numerous others, has been invented. Such capacity has not been lacking in France for three centuries, and owing to its reverence for the small number, it has again and again made a sort of chamber music of literature possible, which is sought for in vain elsewhere in Europe. The second thing, whereby the French can lay claim to a superiority over Europe, is their ancient, many-sided, moralistic culture, owing to which one finds on an average, even in the petty romancier of the newspapers and chance boulevardier de Paris, a psychological sensitiveness and curiosity, of which, for example, one has no conception, to say nothing of the thing itself, in Germany. The Germans lack a couple of centuries of the moralistic work requisite thereto, which, as we have said, France has not grudged. Those who call the Germans naive on that account give them commendation for a defect. As the opposite of the German inexperience and innocence, involuptate psychologica, which is not too remotely associated with the tediousness of German intercourse, and as the most successful expression of genuine French curiosity and inventive talent in this domain of delicate thrills, Henri Bale may be noted, that remarkable anticipatory and forerunning man, who, with a Napoleonic tempo, traversed his Europe, in fact several centuries of the European soul, as a surveyor and discoverer thereof. It has required two generations to overtake him one way or another, to divine long afterwards some of the riddles that perplexed and enraptured him, this strange epicurean and man of interrogation, the last great psychologist of France. There is yet a third claim to superiority. In the French character there is a successful halfway synthesis of the North and South, which makes them comprehend many things, and enjoins upon them other things, which an Englishman can never comprehend. Their temperament, turned alternately to and from the South, in which from time to time the Provencal and Ligurian blood froths over, preserves them from the dreadful, northern, grey in grey, from sunless conceptual spectrism, and from poverty of blood. Our German infirmity of taste, for the excessive prevalence of which, at the present moment, blood and iron, that is to say high politics, has with great resolution been prescribed, according to a dangerous healing art, which bids me wait and wait, but not yet hope. There is also still in France a pre-understanding and ready welcome for those rarer and rarely gratified men, who are too comprehensive to find satisfaction in any kind of fatherlandism, 
and know how to love the South when in the North, and the North when in the South, the born Midlanders, the good Europeans. For them Bizet has made music, this latest genius, who has seen a new beauty and seduction, who has discovered a piece of the South in music. 255. I hold that many precautions should be taken against German music. Suppose a person loves the South as I love it, as a great school of recovery for the most spiritual and the most sensuous ills, as a boundless solar profusion and effulgence, which o'erspreads a sovereign existence believing in itself. Well, such a person will learn to be somewhat on his guard against German music, because, in injuring his taste anew, it will also injure his health anew. Such a southerner, a southerner not by origin but by belief, if he should dream of the future of music, must also dream of it being freed from the influence of the north, and must have in his ears the prelude to a deeper, mightier, and perhaps more perverse and mysterious music, a super-German music, which does not fade, pale and die away, as all German music does, at the sight of the blue wanton sea and the Mediterranean clearness of sky, a super-European music which holds its own even in presence of the brown sunsets of the desert, whose soul is akin to the palm-tree, and can be at home and can roam with big, beautiful, lonely beasts of prey. I could imagine a music, of which the rarest charm would be, that it knew nothing more of good and evil. Only that here and there perhaps some sailor's homesickness, some golden shadows and tender weaknesses, might sweep lightly over it. An art which, from the far distance, would see the colours of a sinking and almost incomprehensible moral world fleeing towards it, and would be hospitable enough and profound enough to receive such belated fugitives. 256. Owing to the morbid estrangement which the nationality craze has induced, and still induces, among the nations of Europe, owing also to the short-sighted and hasty-handed politicians, who, with the help of this craze, are at present in power, and do not suspect to what extent the disintegrating policy they pursue must necessarily be only an interlude policy. Owing to all this, and much else that is altogether unmentionable at present, the most unmistakable signs that Europe wishes to be one are now overlooked, or arbitrarily and falsely misinterpreted. With all the more profound and large-minded men of this century, the real general tendency of the mysterious labour of their souls was to prepare the way for that new synthesis, and tentatively to anticipate the European of the future. Only in their simulations, or in their weaker moments, in old age perhaps, did they belong to the fatherlands, they only rested from themselves when they became patriots. I think of such men as Napoleon, Goethe, Beethoven, Stendhal, Heinrich Heine, Schopenhauer. It must not be taken amiss if I also count Richard Wagner among them, about whom one must not let oneself be deceived by his own misunderstandings. Geniuses like him have seldom the right to understand themselves. Still less, of course, by the unseemly noise with which he is now resisted and opposed in France. The fact remains, nevertheless, that Richard Wagner and the later French Romanticism of the forties are most closely and intimately related to one another. They are akin, fundamentally akin, in all the heights and depths of their requirements. It is Europe, the one Europe, whose soul presses urgently and longingly, outwards and upwards, in their multifarious and boisterous art, whither? Into a new light? towards a new sun? But who would attempt to express accurately what all these masters of new modes of speech could not express distinctly? It is certain that the same storm and stress tormented them, 
that they sought in the same manner these last great seekers all of them steeped in literature to their eyes and ears the first artists of universal literary culture for the most part even themselves writers poets intermediaries and blenders of the arts and the senses wagner as musician is reckoned among painters as poet among musicians as artist generally among actors all of them fanatics for expression at any cost i specially mention delacroix the nearest related to wagner all of them great discoverers in the realm of the sublime also of the loathsome and dreadful still greater discoverers in effect in display in the art of the show-shop all of them talented far beyond their genius out and out virtuosi with mysterious accesses to all that seduces allures constrains and upsets born enemies of logic and of the straight line hankering after the strange the exotic the monstrous the crooked and the self-contradictory as men tantaluses of the will plebeian parvenus who knew themselves to be incapable of a noble tempo or of a lento in life and action think of balzac for instance unrestrained workers almost destroying themselves by work antinomians and rebels in manners ambitious and insatiable without equilibrium and enjoyment all of them finally shattering and sinking down at the christian cross and with right and reason for who of them would have been sufficiently profound and sufficiently original for an anti-christian philosophy on the whole a boldly daring splendidly overbearing high-flying and aloft updragging class of higher men who had first to teach their century and it is the century of the masses the conception higher man let the german friends of richard wagner advise together as to whether there is anything purely german in the wagnerian art or whether its distinction does not consist precisely in coming from super-german sources and impulses in which connection it may not be underrated how indispensable paris was to the development of his type which the strength of his instincts made him long to visit at the most decisive time and how the whole style of his proceedings of his self-apostolate could only perfect itself in sight of the french socialistic original on a more subtle comparison it will perhaps be found to the honour of richard wagner's german nature that he has acted in everything with more strength daring severity and elevation than a nineteenth-century frenchman could have done owing to the circumstance that we germans are as yet nearer to barbarism than the french perhaps even the most remarkable creation of richard wagner is not only at present but for ever inaccessible incomprehensible and inimitable to the whole latter-day latin race the figure of siegfried that very free man who is probably far too free too hard too cheerful too healthy too anti-catholic for the taste of old and mellow civilized nations he may even have been a sin against romanticism this anti-latin siegfried well wagner atoned amply for this sin in his old sad days when anticipating a taste which has meanwhile passed into politics he began with the religious vehemence peculiar to him to preach at least the way to rome if not to walk therein that these last words may not be misunderstood i will call to my aid a few powerful rhymes which will even betray to less delicate ears what i mean what i mean counter to the last wagner and his parsifal music is this our mode from german heart came this vexed ululating from german body this self lacerating is ours this priestly hand dilation this incense fuming exultation is ours this faltering falling shambling 
this quite uncertain ding-dong dangling, this sly nun-oggling, ave our bell ringing, this holy false enraptured heaven o'er springing, is this our mode? Think well, ye still wait for admission, for what ye hear is Rome, Rome's faith by intuition. End of chapter 8